So we are recording now. Um, so let's start by seeing if you have any questions regarding the interrupts. Um, so the chat, okay, here the chat, put it here. Any questions? You can un always unmute yourself. Uh, it will be better to unmute yourself and ask your question better than writing on the chat window. So there are no questions. Okay, so last time we started uh, talking about interrupts, which is basically the topic covered in, uh, it is one of the topics covered in chapter six. Uh, chapter six basically covers the interrupts. Um, covers the interrupts, uh, the clock generation, uh, and resets. So there are many uh, topics covered in this chapter. We will touch upon them. There are many details re related to these, uh, 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 to these uh, topics, uh, uh, but we will just present uh, whatever, uh, the, the things that we are uh, in need of in this course. So basically, we discussed the concept of interrupts last time, and we basically, and uh, basically the interrupt we said is an event that forces the CPU to change the flow of the program execution to somewhere else in the program in the in the memory, and this event is usually a hardware event uh, 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 that requests to be serviced by the CPU that requests the CPU. Uh, to pay attention in order to provide its service, in order to provide it, its resources to the source of the interrupt. So basically this is done by executing a special piece of code called the interrupt service routine that is loaded in the uh, uh, memory to service the, re, uh, the, the, the event or the interrupt uh, request. And once that is done, the execution resumes back to the normal program. And this is very similar. This mechanism is very similar uh, to the way uh, subroutines uh, work, except to the fact that the change in the program flow in the subroutines is caused by a software instruction, which is the call instruction or the jump, jump subroutine or the branch subroutine instruction. Uh, while in the interrupts, mostly, mostly the, the, the change in the program flow is uh, due to, the, to a hardware event. And this hardware event is usually related to the input outputs and the peripheral devices that are uh, that are integrated within the microcontroller or from external devices that are connected to the microcontroller using special input pins for the uh, to, to, to input the uh, interrupt uh, request. So this was the basic idea. We talked about the functions of the interrupts, which are basically used to interface to provide a better or more efficient approach to interface with the devices which saves the resources of the CPU and provides prompt response to the interrupt, uh, to the request, to the services requested by other uh, devices. Now we said that the interrupts can be classified uh, from different perspectives. Uh, interrupts could be divided, the, 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 uh, classified based on the mask, mask, on maskability, which means whether you as a programmer can program these interrupts uh, to, ena uh, to enable or uh, in, uh, to, in order to, in to uh, enable or disable these interrupts or to mask or not to mask these uh, interrupts. So some interrupts, interrupt sources uh, are maskable. In other words, you can program them, you can enable, disable them, while others are not. So we call them non-maskable interrupts. And the existence of such or of, or of different types of such interrupt types depends on the design of the CPU or the um, microcontroller. Uh, so the HCS12 that we have uh, has both types. Some of the interrupt sources are maskable while other interrupt sources are not maskable. Another thing related to interrupts is, uh, 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 is priority. Uh, or before this, some interrupt, uh, some uh, the interrupts can be classified also based on the source, whether it is external or 
internal to the CPU or the microcontroller. So some interrupt sources are uh, are integrated inside the CPU or the sources are inside the CPU or the microcontroller, while others are could be external. And for our microcontroller, uh, it has some of the interrupt sources are from within the microcontroller, while other sources are from the uh, uh, outside are from outside the microcontroller. Another thing is the interrupt priority. We said that uh, in case the CPU or the microcontroller supports uh, different sources of interrupts, what happens if uh, more than one interrupt request arrives at the same time uh, to the CPU? In this case, we said that uh, there should be some sort of priority. The CPU will service one uh, the, the source X before source Y and source Y before source Z. And this is called a priority. And this priority could be fixed uh, or could be programmable. You can define which interrupt request to be serviced before other interrupt uh, requests. And in our microcontroller, uh, we have some sort of uh, flexibility in changing the priority of interrupt, but not not full. It is not full control. We can only raise one of the interrupt sources to be the highest, while the other uh, interrupts will have fixed priority. We will talk about this uh, uh, later today. Uh, we talked also about the interrupt operation. We said basically when an interrupt request uh, uh, arrives, several things uh, occur. And basically, and these things uh, basically should support the idea of this mechanism of changing the program flow to somewhere else and returning back. So we discuss this in details. Um, one important thing that we also talked about is uh, where to find this interrupt service routine. It is a piece of code that is loaded in memory. So we need a mechanism to specify the address of this code or this sub subroutine. In case of normal subroutines, we already provide the address as part or as uh, an operand in the instruction. If you remember, we say jump subroutine sub one or jump subroutine uh, whatever delay millisecond. But here we don't have uh, uh, such flexibility because the cause of the flow change is a hardware event, so we need a, 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 a mechanism to specify the address. So how to specify the address of the interrupt service routine that contains the piece of code that services this type of interrupt? We said that there are many approaches. Um, uh, one, one approach is to use a predefined location. For example, every interrupt source has a certain set of memory locations starting uh, from certain address for each type or for all the types. Like in the PIC, all interrupt, in the PIC 16 series, all interrupt sources, they share the same in, uh, address, or we call it the, int, the same interrupt vector, the same interrupt vector, which is the term that is used to refer to the address of the interrupt service routine. So we may have the interrupt vector fixed when the CPU or the microcontroller design, or we may have what we call an interrupt vector table, which is basically a table that is uh, the, that is that has a, a fixed location in memory. And in that table, each entry in that table, in each entry in that table, we can load the address of the interrupt service routine for different interrupt sources, which is the approach that is adopted in the HCS12 micro. Controller. The third approach, I will not talk about it. We are co uh, concerned and interested in this approach in which basically we have the memory. This is the memory. And usually we have a certain, certain set of locations that are reserved to store the interrupt vector table. In our case, the table starts for the HCS12, starts from F, 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 F. F, 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 E, and it goes down. And every two locations, we need two locations for every interrupt source because the address is 16 bits. So in each of these two locations, we store an address for the interrupt source, for the interrupt service routine, for every interrupt source. Um, in the supported by the microcontroller. For example, if you remember, 
These two addresses are very important. We call them the reset vector address. In this location, you store the starting address of your program. And if you worked with Code Warrior, if you remember, at the end of the code, we the, you, you used to see something like this, ORG, dollar sign, F, F, uh, F, E, and then you say, um, uh, what, 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 what do you store usually? What do you write here? Do you remember, guys? At the end of the program, we need to put the address of the starting address of our program in these two in these two locations. So we used to say define constant byte, right? For example, start. Where start, if you go up, is the label that points to the beginning of your program. So this these two instructions instruct. Uh, the assembler to load the address of this label in these two locations. So when the microcontroller is powered up, when the microcontroller is powered up, the CPU will come to this address, which is FFFE, to fetch the address of your program, to fetch the address of your uh, uh, program. So of course, here we used to write some originates. We say originate dollar sign 1000, so what will be stored here is basically 1000, which is 1000, zero, 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 which is 1000. Zero, zero, zero. The same thing happens to for, uh, with interrupts. For example, if we have interrupt source number one, so these two addresses are reserved for interrupt source one. So in, this, in these two addresses, as we will see later, we will store the address of the interrupt service routine. So when that interrupt occurs, the CPU will come to these two, to this location, two locations, load 16 bit and use them as the address of the interrupt service routine. So the set of these locations that define or in which we can store the addresses of the interrupt service routines for different sources is called the interrupt uh, vector table and each and the content of each of these locations is called the interrupt vector, which is the starting address of the interrupt uh, service routine, the starting address of the interrupt service routine. So this is the approach that is uh, used in the HCS12 microcontroller, which is basically uh, an interrupt vector table in which each two locations are used and specified to hold the starting address of the interrupt service routine for any, for every source, interrupt source, supported uh, by the microcontroller. So this was, I guess, the last thing we talked about uh, last time. So um, uh, let's move uh, forward. Um, yes. Now, the, uh, the, 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 the operation of the interrupts is basically, as we said, we have a main program that is running an interrupt request arrives from some source, you go, you execute the interrupt service routine, then you go back. Now, this mechanism has an overhead, has an execution overhead, because you need to divert the flow of the program. So at least you need some time to change the content of the program counter with the value of or, or the address of the interrupt uh, service routine. So the CPU basically when the interrupt request arrived, arrives, it has to go to the memory to the specified location that contains the ISR address of that interrupt source, fetch it, store it in the program counter, and then start execution. Next, one is, once it's finished the ISR, it has to load the program counter with the return address. In order to do this trick, we need to save the return address, which is the address of the instruction that comes here in the main program in the stack. So we need some time to do all this stuff. And on this slide, we have some details. Uh, for the interrupts, there's some sort of overhead. We need to save the CPU registers. At least we need to save the program counter, which contains the return address. And the best way to save it is uh, the stack, the HCS12 does not only save the program counter, it also saves the uh, 
all the CPU register in the stack, it, which means it saves the program counter, which contains the return address, A, B, X, Y, uh, and stack pointer uh, uh, register. Uh, now, doing this requires some time. So uh, the data sheet says it takes nine cycles to do this stuff. We need to execute the ISR. So this, we know how to calculate it. Then we need to return from the interrupt. We need to return from the interrupt service routine, and this will take time. And usually this takes between nine to 11 cycles. So at least there are 18 cycles required, assuming that the interrupt service routine only is empty interrupt service routine. <laughs> However, usually the interrupt service routine is not empty. There are many instructions here, or there are some instructions here that provide the service for the interrupt uh, uh, source. So the bottom line here, or the summary here, that uh, uh, processing interrupt requests requires some time because basically you are executing instructions. So you need to take that into consideration uh, if you are working with interrupts. Now, because we are talking about interrupts, which basically uh, related to working or changing the program flow, uh, one, one source that changing, one event that changes the program flow is the reset is the reset or the power the um, the reset so most microcontrollers and cpu and cpus they come with a special input called the reset input and using this special input reset for example this is hcs12 microcontroller there is a special input to reset the microcontroller. And basically, this if this is the program that is being executed, if you put a low value here, because this is active low uh, uh, signal, the program will change its flow back to the beginning of the program. The flow is changed to the beginning of uh, the program. So, so it, it, it can be thought of like the interrupts, but the interrupts, are kind of are a little bit different because when you finish the ISR, you return <coughs> you return to the main program over here. You don't return to this point. When you do the reset, you go back to the beginning of the program, and this might be useful to re uh, to start uh, to restart the application, your system, without powering uh, the system uh, on uh, off and. Uh, on so it's kind of related to the interrupts that's why usually most books they put it they put this topic uh, along with interrupts because they change it changes the flow of the program but the change is different here because basically you start everything right from the uh, uh, beginning uh, i will not talk about <coughs> this in details however uh, as i said usually the reset input is an active low signal. So usually, when you <coughs> when you use this input, when you want to use this input to reset your system, you need to like to put a switch, a push button, for example, and you put here a pull-up resistor. This is VDD or five volt, and this is ground. So as long as the switch is open active uh, the value here is high and nothing happens but when you push the switch down the value of logic zero and a zero will appear here and you will reset the microcontroller so when you release the button this comes back to high so if you go to the data sheet uh, you can find how what is the minimum time uh, that you need to uh, uh, to, uh, that you need to uh, uh, keep uh, in order to uh, have a reset effect on the microcontroller. In order to have a reset, this input has to be zero for a certain period of uh, uh, time in order to have uh, a reset. So um, this is the, in general, the basic uh, 
idea. So if you look at the pinout of the microcontroller, you will find here the uh, uh, reset. I will zoom in. This is the reset input, which is active low signal. There are many inputs here. Most of them are for input and outputs, but others are for power, for clock, for reset, and for uh, interrupts, as we will see uh, uh, in, uh, shortly. OK, so this is the basic idea of interrupts That's in that. general. If you go, if you read about any microcontroller or CPU, the basic concepts are the same. Usually, the CPU is designed to monitor the events, the hardware events, using uh, what we call the interrupt circuit. So they monitor the requests, and they uh, receive a request. They instruct the CPU to be interrupted and to respond to the interrupt request uh, using the steps that we saw before. However, what makes what, what is different between CPUs and microcontrollers is the way how these steps are implemented. For example, where to find the address of the interrupt service routine, <coughs> what happens on the ISR, does uh, the CPU pushes all the registers to stack or only the return address, all that stuff is, all of these details usually differ from one microcontroller to, uh, to another. Yes, who has a question? Ahmed? Doctor, كيف بدي أحول الإشي مثلاً إلى software؟ أنا أحكي لل CPU إنه فعلياً صار عندي interrupts بس جاي من hardware. يعني في flag yes. بتغير وفي إشي بتغير. Yes, هلا رح نجيها إحنا بس what I said, I just said that usually for the in order for the CPU to support interrupts, there is usually an interrupt circuit. Uh -huh. inside the CPU that monitors different interrupt requests, either from the inside or from the outside. And once such any of these requests arrives, the CPU, this interrupt circuit instructs the CPU to halt, to stop, and pay attention to the interrupt requests to service them. And this is usually done through, yes, special bits, uh, by setting special bits automatically uh, in some special registers that the CPU will uh, can uh, that will tell the CPU that, that there is an interrupt request. Yes, then. Doctor, can I ask? For example, the reset is present in the vector table, or do I need to put the reset? Reset basically the reset the reset signal that comes into this pen basically will will instruct the CPU to go back to the memory and fetch the starting address of my program from address F F F E. Ah, automatically, not I. Not put. Not present. Issue in the vector table. No, I put. لا لازم هو there has to be something at this address and this something is loaded into memory when I load my program that's why as I just said we usually end or we write in our program org dollar sign f f f e then we say define constant by for example start yes right yes so this start is basically the address so when you load your program in memory the address, this address is loaded starting at this address, which is basically, we need two bytes, FFFE and FFFF. So this is what happens on reset. You tell the CPU, stop what you are doing, go to address FFFE and bring, uh, fetch the, uh, the, its content and use yes. that content as an address for my program. Okay. Okay? Yes. Marwan. يعطيك العافية دكتور الله يعافيك انا مروان دكتور يعني هلا بالريست بيكون موجود يعني مثلا زي كلير للريجسترز بيكون يس يس فبال بتكون سوفت كودد اوريدي يعني انه بيكون هلا بليز كلير ذس ذس سيجنال ذس سيجنال تريجرز سمثينج اور وات وي كول تريجرز ذا ريست مود اوف اوبريشن اند ون اوف ذا ثينجز ذات ذات هابن that happens uh, in reset mode operation is to restart the program execution right from the beginning. 
Now, other things happen, which include clearing or registers or setting them to some initial value. Uh, whether we are talking about CPU registers or we are talking about other registers that are inside the microcontroller, such as the direction registers for the input output ports. What is the default value, for example, for register DDRB? What are the default value? Uh, is port B initially configured as input or output on reset when we start the microcontroller? So the reset mode it will start the program execution and it will restore the register values uh, to their default values. Uh, whether we are talking about the registers that are inside the CPU or the registers that are related to the input output ports and, uh, <coughs> uh, and the peripheral devices inside the microcontroller. Dr. Kamal, could I ask you, why do we need to mask for interrupts? لانك انت يعني لو لو كل الانتربتس نون ماسكبل وي كانت كنترول ذيم سو ديبندينج اون يور نيد سام تايمز يو مايت نيد تو يوز تو انتربت سورسز اوت اوف فور سو يو نيد اونلي تو انتر تو انيبل ذيس تو سورسز يو دونت نيد تو انيبل اول اوف ذيم اور يو دونت نيد تو هاف اول اوف ذيم انيبلد بيكوز Uh, uh, this may, uh, if all of them are non-maskable, uh, in other words, they are all enabled, and you are using two of them, what happens, for example, uh, if there is a false interrupt request from a, the, the, a third, the third source, it will interrupt the CPU. And how, how can uh, such false interrupt uh, happens? Let's consider this case. This is a microcontroller. And let's say it supports two different interrupt sources, source one and source two. So for example, whenever this source has a rising edge, it will interrupt the CPU. Whenever this source has a rising edge, for example, it will interrupt the CPU. Now, if we assume that these interrupt sources are, not all of them are non-maskable, and I am only using source one, what will happen if something happened while the system is running such that there is a rising edge on source 2. This is an interrupt request. It is not non-maskable, so it will interrupt the CPU, but the, 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 I'm not using that source. The CPU is not, the system is not using this interrupt source. So if I don't need, if I'm using only one source, I need to disable the other source, just in case a false request uh, occurs. Right? Ah, uh, tamam. Shukran doktor. Okay. All right. <coughs> okay. So now uh, uh, let's look at the details of the interrupts or some of the interrupts that are available in the HCS12. Now the HCS12 has many interrupt sources. Some of them are maskable. Some of them are non-maskable. Some of these interrupt sources are uh, uh, internal, some of them are external. Uh, so on this slide, we have uh, um, uh, uh, some of these interrupts. For example, here we have uh, maskable interrupts. I'm sorry. Um, yes, we have uh, maskable uh, interrupts. So, oops. Maskable interrupts, and this includes all the, uh, the interrupts, all the interrupts related to the peripheral devices. Peripheral devices, such as the A to D con uh, converter, such as the serial uh, communication module, such as the PWM module. All of these peripheral devices usually can interrupt the CPU that is inside the uh, microcontroller. So all of them that can interrupt, and all the interrupts related to these integrated devices are maskable. In other words, I can enable or disable them depending on my need, depending on my application. So we will come to some of these interrupt uh, sources later in chapter, in later chapters when we talk about 
uh, for example, the A to D conversion, the pulse width modulation, and uh, uh, so on. Now, the CPU has, these are internal uh, sources, and all of them are maskable. Another interrupt source that is maskable is the IRQ. The IRQ interrupt, IRQ interrupt, which is related or it is multiplexed with pin PE1. So if you go to back, um, yes, if we go forward and I zoom in, yes. Um, I zoom in here, we have IRQ multiplexed with PE1, which means this pin, which is a pin, P pin, uh, PE, P pin number one from port E, is multiplexed with another functionality, which is IRQ, which is interrupt request, simply. It is IRQ interrupt. So this pin, the signal that appears on this pin, which is PE1, can be enabled, can be used to interrupt the CPU, can be used to interrupt the CPU. Uh, and we will come to the details or the conditions and the configurations of the, in, this interrupt shortly. Now, another inter external source of interrupt is the XIRQ which is external, however, this interrupt request is non-maskable. This interrupt request is non-maskable. Uh, XIRQ uh, interrupt. So this is multiplexed with PE0, which is also XIRQ. XIRQ. So these are external sources which can in in interrupt the CPU based on some condition. For example, the IRQ is edge sensitive interrupt, which means it can be configured to interrupt the CPU on a rising edge or to go to interrupt the CPU on a falling edge. So whenever there is a transition from high to low, I can interrupt the CPU or I can configure this source to interrupt the CPU when there is an, uh, a, a, a transition between from low to, uh, to high. For the XIRQ, we will see uh, later the details how to enable, uh, how to use this interrupt source and how, what is the condition upon which we can interrupt the microcontroller. Uh, now, uh, another external source that can interrupt the program execution, we already talked about it, which is the reset, which is the uh, uh, reset. So the, all of these are related to hardware events. These interrupt sources are hardware-based events that can interrupt the CPU. Uh, uh, there is also one uh, source of interrupt that can interrupt the CPU in the HCS12, which is the uh, SWI interrupt, which is basically the software interrupt, which is basically a software-generated interrupt using a special instruction called SWI, software interrupt this basically this instruction it is an instruction in the instruction set architecture when you when it when executed basically it will interrupt the program execution and handles the and puts the microcontroller under the control of a debugger a software debugger which is basically something like code warrior so you can connect your microcontroller to the code warrior and if you want at any at any moment of time to view the current content and the current status of the microcontroller you basically you basically put swi instruction in your program at the place where you want to investigate uh, your microcontroller content and this will stop will stop the program execution and handle the uh, control to the debugger which is in this case the uh, code warrior. So this instruction is only used when you want to uh, give access or control to the software that resides on your uh, PC. Uh, so uh, maybe um, in chapter four or three, maybe in chapter four, yeah, we saw some example 
that ends with this instruction, SWI instruction. I remember that. Okay, so there are many interrupt sources, some internal related to the peripheral devices, some external related to IRQ and XIRQ uh, signals or inputs. One of these sources is software related interrupt, which is called SWI, which is related to the uh, SWI instruction, in addition, of course, to the reset, reset uh, input or the C reset uh, event. Okay, so there are many sources, and as we will see, there are many, many, many sources of interrupts in this microcontroller because this microcontroller has too many peripheral devices integrated within it. So you will find a lot of interrupt sources. Each of these devices is associated at least with one interrupt service, with one interrupt service that can interrupt the uh, CPU. Okay, so these are the, in general, uh, this is a general idea about the interrupt sources in our microcontroller. Now, how about the mechanism of finding the location of the interrupt service routine associated with each of these sources, with these of these sources? As we said, usually, <coughs> or the way it is done in the SCS12 is basically in the memory, there is the last few addresses or the, the last locations are reserved for the uh, interrupt vector table, which is starting from address FF, going back to some address here. Each look, two locations are associated with one of these interrupt sources where you as a programmer can, you, you can store the address of your interrupt service routine. So in the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the assignment of these addresses is basically listed in table 6.1, which is here. This is part of the table, by the way. This is not the whole table. If you go to the book or the data sheet, this table is kind of big because there are many, many, many interrupt sources in this microcontroller. So what we are concerned of about this table, here it lists the type of the interrupt source. <coughs> here it, uh, it tells you the vector address. It tells you the vector address. So it tells you where to find the vector address. For example, the first one is the reset. So the reset is, sorry, the reset is assigned to address dollar sign FFE and technically dollar sign FFE and FFFF because we need two locations to store the 16-bit address of our ISR. For example, uh, the IRQ, if I zoom in, Uh, for example, the IRQ, the IRQ is assigned is assigned FFF2 and FFF3. So you have two locations where you can store the address, the ISR address of the IRQ, or basically the code that services any interrupt request that comes from this source, which is the IRQ source. So this is very uh, important table. Another thing that is, and if you go on, you will see different sources of uh, interrupts and their associated vector or the address where you can find the vector, ad, uh, the vector address, the interrupt uh, address of this uh, source. Uh, now, uh, one more thing is this column, the CCR mask. Now, we said some of these sources are maskable. Some of these sources are not maskable. So this, uh, how, how you can, uh, if the source is, uh, the interrupt source is, not, is, is, is maskable, how you can enable or disable it? Uh, usually this is done at, you, at two levels, uh, 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 global level and individual level. So you can enable uh, uh, you need to, in order to enable some interrupt source, you need to enable it 
<coughs> it individually and globally and globally so this is done usual using special bits in the ccr register if you go back to the ccr uh, uh, register uh, ccr yes it's, yeah, it's not here the ccr register we used to see bit i and bit x now bit i stands for interrupt and this bit is used to enable uh, interrupts globally so the, uh, this bit is used to enable interrupts enably, uh, to enable interrupts globa uh, uh, globally. In other words, you enable all interrupts, but they will not be enabled until you enable them individually. And I will come, I will, I will tell you what's the idea behind this two level of enabling uh, 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 the interrupts. So <coughs> in this column, it tells us which bit is responsible we have to work with in order to enable or disable these interrupt sources. So here, all of these interrupt sources, which are related to, if, uh, to peripheral devices, basically, ha you need to clear this bit, which is the I bit, in order to enable them globally. To enable them globally. Now, even if you enable them by clearing this bit, they will not interrupt the CPU unless you enable each of them locally until you enable each of them locally. And this is usually done using special bits that are available in special registers related to each of these interrupt sources. For example, the IRQ, the IRQ, so interrupt source, is a maskable interrupt. So to enable it, we have to clear the I bit in the CCR register, and we have to go to another register called the IRQ control register, or, I, or IRQ enable register, and set or clear specific bits in that register in order to enable it locally. So for any of these maskable interrupts to be able to interrupt the CPU, we have to go to their corresponding register and set or clear specific bits, and then go to the CCR register to clear the I bit or the interrupt bit. Now, why it is done this way? Why not to have just one bit or one, uh, one level of enable to these maskable interrupts? For example, for the IRQ, why not to have the IRQ enable bit? This is the name of the bit in this register. This is a special register or memory location effectively related to the IRQ in which you can configure the IRQ. And this is one of the bits, it is bit number seven, that you need to set in order to enable this interrupt source. So why not to have this bit only in this register to enable this interrupt source uh, and exclude this bit, which is the I bit because there is very important thing, very important uh, principle in interrupts, which is um, which is adopted in most microcontrollers and CPU, which is, we said interrupts work like this. When you when the program is executing, when the program is executing, an interrupt request arrives, the program will change its flow to the place where uh, uh, the subroutine, the interrupt service routine is stored. Okay, so this is already, we know it. Now let's assume that another interrupt request arrived to the CPU, so here we have, ISR uh, one interrupt request, uh, or let me write it IR one. This is interrupt request one. So the CPU is interrupted at this point. It will you uh, it will fetch the address of the interrupt service routine from the corresponding interrupt vector, and it will start executing the ISR. Now, what if another request interrupt request 
arrives while I am executing the ISR. What will happen? How will the CPU deal with this new request while it is still servicing the current request? How it, how it will deal with this? The, 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 the common uh, thing or the common approach to work with this is basically to ignore this request, continue the execution. Once you finish, you go to the main program and you will, at this moment, you will, the CPU will discover that there is a waiting interrupt request. So it will go back and execute ISR1 and it will execute here ISR2 and so on. So what is the idea here? The idea here is very simple. If the CPU is servicing some interrupt request, it cannot be interrupted to service another interrupt request. Is it clear? So I usually say it like this. No interrupt can interrupt an interrupt. So this interrupt cannot interrupt the CPU while, while it is servicing another interrupt. So what does this imply? This implies that if the CPU is servicing some interrupt request, all other maskable, all other interrupt sources have to be disabled. And how can you disable all interrupt sources? You need to know which of them is enabled. And it's not you who should know, it is the CPU should know uh, which of them are, are enabled. So it has to search through all the enabled bits of these interrupts sources and basically disable them. So this is not, uh, not, uh, not practical, it's not efficient. So how to do that? Basically, uh, 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 use a global interrupt enable bit so that if you want to enable or disable all interrupts, you just work with that bit. You don't know, care which source is enabled and which source is disabled. So basically, if, if this is the CPU, if I have two sources, let's say, of interrupts, two sources of interrupts, basically, they have to pass through this, let's say, door and this door, and then they have to pass through this door in order to reach the CPU. So what is this door? Basically, this is the global enable, and these, are, these doors are the local enables. So even if the interrupt is enabled locally or individually, it cannot, its requests cannot pass to the CPU unless the global door is open. So if you want to implement this, Basically, while you are servicing some request, you need to disable all interrupts. So you basically open this door. You don't need to go to every interrupt source and disable it. And once you finish, you just close this door and just uh, allow any other waiting re re interrupt request to come in, to pass through the CPU. So this is very important. Maskable interrupts are usually done, uh, the enabling or the masking of these interrupts is done at two levels, individual level and the global level. Now the global level is important because we want to disable all interrupts while we are servicing some interrupt request. And once we finish, we need to enable them all. So we just enable them individually at the beginning of the program. We enable it globally and uh, disabling all interrupt sources during this will happen only if we receive some interrupt request. Yes, Mohammed. Doctor, يعني هوس the globally ما راح نعملها enable إلا إذا إجا another interrupt request ولا خلاص مجرد ما أنا إجاني interrupt request راح الاثنين يعني نعملهم enable locally or globally. لا لا هذا عبارة عن setting. It is a setting that you do at the beginning of your program. You write your program, you know which sources you are using, so you go to this enable and 
set it, let's say you enable this source, and then you enable this source and you run your system, you, you, you operate your system. Now, if an interrupt request of this source, let's say source one arrives while this switch is closed and this switch is called, is closed, then the request will pass through to the, CP, to the CPU and the CPU will be interrupted and it will start executing the ISR. And uh -huh. while executing this ISR, I guarantee that no one can interrupt me because automatically, once the CPU starts servicing this request, it opens this switch only. So even there is a request from source number two, it will not pass through. It will wait here. So no. It will not interrupt the CPU. So this is very important. No interrupt request can interrupt the service routine, the interrupt service routine, the execution of the interrupt service routine, while it is the CPU, while it's executing an interrupt service routine. No interrupt request can interrupt servicing another interrupt request. Sorry. And the, the best way to do it is to disable all interrupt sources at the, uh, before start, starting to execute the interrupt service routine. And the best way to do it is to have this single door or single enable that disables all or that prevents any request from any other source to pass it through while I am servicing some request. Okay? Other questions? Um, no? يس يا زلمة بخصوص هو هذا الجلوبال انترابت هلا هو يعني خلاص باي ديفولت لما يعني يعمل الاي اس ار 1 فور اكزامبل هو خلاص باي ديفولت بيخلي يعني بيعمل ديسابل يس السي بي يو السي بي يو وانس ذا سي بي يو ريسيفز ا ريكويست ان انترابت ريكويست ذا فيري فيرست ثينج ات دوز It finishes the current instruction and it disables all maskable interrupts. Okay. So, so uh, this is done automatically. No, it's not done by you. Okay. So you and when you when you when when the CPU goes back to the main program, you usually write some sort of return instruction here, special return instruction, which is RTI, return from interrupt. And one of the things that this instruction does is basically to close this door. In other words, it enables all maskable interrupts. And it pushes all the values that were pushed in the stack due to the arrival of the interrupt request. تمام. طب دكتور الـ priority interrupts اللي حكينا عنها هاي طب متى بتكون؟ Yes. خلينا أرجيك بالكلام. Okay. So now the idea, is the idea clear? Yes, yes. The masking and the enabling. Maskable interrupts Uh, 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 we have two levels of, uh, of enabling it. So in this column, we have the global interrupt bit, and we here we have the local interrupt enable uh, uh, bit. And, um, and what we have here is basically, uh, for example here, this is, um, um, This is, uh, okay, highlighter. Um, I cannot highlight when I zoom the problem. I cannot highlight, yes, let me double again, highlighter. Yeah, I cannot highlight when I zoom out. Uh, the basic idea is uh, this is the name of the bit in the CCR register, in the control, uh, condition control register. There is a special bit called I bit for, for interrupt. Uh, which has to be cleared in order to enable all maskable uh, uh, interrupts. And here, the local enable, we have as this word is the name of some special register related to the IRQ. And inside it, there is a bit which is called here IRQ enable, EM enable. It is a bit inside this register, as we will see. Uh, later that has to be worked with in order to enable this interrupt. Okay, now for the priority, we said that we have different sources of interrupts here. What if we have two 
interrupt requests that arrive at the same time. Which re request will be serviced first? Now, we said there, is some so there has to be some sort of priority, either hardware-based priority or software-based priority. Now, hardware-based priority implies that the priority is fixed usually. You cannot change the priority. Uh, uh, software implies that you can play around with the priority. You can change the order by which the different, the different uh, requests are uh, serviced. For our microcontroller, the case is basically a I consider it as a hybrid because it is somehow fixed, but at the same time, you can change it. You can play with it a little bit. It's not that flexible. Uh, and what is basically uh, done in this microcontroller is the hardware, the priority of different sources is uh, defined here in the vector number. This vector number is basically numbering a number to each vector and the lower lower the number the highest the priority this implies that the reset has the highest priority so if the cpu receives a, a reset a, a reset a low signal on the reset pin and for example an irq interrupt it will service the reset because the reset has the highest priority Comes next, interrupt number one, which is a clock monitor failure reset, something we'll talk about later. COP, C, uh, COP failure reset, and so on. So as you move up in the vector number, you are having lower priority. So IRQ has lower priority than XIRQ, and both they have lower priority than SWI. So this is fixed. However, you can change, you can change uh, uh, the priority, uh, the priority uh, using software, uh, and this change is limited, and by the fact that you can move one of the interrupts, the maskable interrupts, one of the interrupts, all these interrupts, to be the highest, but not higher than the reset not higher than the reset. And this is done basically by writing some value to a special register called the H priority uh, to elevate uh, to highest bit. Let me just zoom in. It is the value uh, to be written to this register, H priority register, to elevate to highest I bit to highest I bit. In other words, in other words, you can change the priority among the maskable interrupts. Among the maskable uh, uh, interrupts. So for example, you can make SPI zero interrupt, SPI zero interrupt higher, higher than uh, IRQ interrupt and how to do that is basically to write some value some value to this register and we will see this later in code so for example if I want SPI zero interrupt to be of higher value than IRQ I just write um, dollar sign D8 dollar sign D8 in this register special register that is available inside the microcontroller. And this, the result of this is moving this source, which is SPI zero to be higher than all of these uh, interrupt sources. But the order of, the, of these interrupt sources will not change. I just only change the priority of this source to be the highest among the maskable interrupts. That's the meaning to the highest I bit to the highest I bit. So I can change the priority among the maskable interrupts. So what is basically this value that you write to this register? If you look, it is D8. What is D8? D8 is the lower by, uh, byte address. Is the lower byte of the address. Here we have the address of SPII is D8, FFD8. So basically we write the low byte of the address inside this register. And this will move this interrupt source to be the highest among 
the maskable intervals. Yes, and you have a question? Uh, no, no, no. Okay. Okay, so uh, uh, this is also part of the table. This is part of the table. I think it's not the whole table. If I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if these are all the sources. Check the data sheet, check the uh, uh, textbook. You will see the full list. I, but I believe this is this is FFBE. This is FFBC. I think yeah, this is the uh, whole table. This is the whole table for all, for different interrupt sources. So in total, we have 57 interrupt sources. Imagine we have 57 interrupt sources in this microcontroller, which is quite a lot. In some microcontrollers, it, you can find maybe one interrupt source, two, three, four, ten. 10. For example, those who studied PEC-16 series, PEC-16 series has four sources of interrupts only. Uh, not 16 series, 16, 484 has four sources of uh, interrupts only. This microcontroller is quite complicated, uh, quite advanced. It has too many interrupt uh, sources. Um, and now for this slide, it's just, it's not, um, uh, I put this slide, uh, despite the fact that it's not directly related to interrupts, but only to show something. Uh, now, this is this slide shows the memory of the PIC, of the XCS12 microcontrollers, and basically this memory is uh, 64 kilobyte, uh, 64 kilobytes of uh, uh, memory. Now, the microcontroller, this microcontroller can be configured uh, in order to make uh, to use different models of the memory. But I will, don't, I will not go into much details of it. What I'm interested in is this one, which is the normal ch single chip mode, which is the mode in which our board uh, uh, works. So basically, the 64 kilobytes, the 64 kilobytes is divided into ranges. For example, uh, 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 for example, uh, if we start from here. Uh, the black region is basically from address 000 to 400 or to 3FF, and it is reserved for special function registers. For special function registers. And what do I mean by special function registers? Registers that are related to the operation of uh, uh, input output ports and peripheral devices and the configuration of the microcontroller. For example, the register that we just talked about the HP, uh, HPRIO register. It is basically a, a register with some address that belongs to this region. Now, this register is not part of the memory, but it has an address from the address space of the memory, similar to the port direction registers. They are not part of the memory, but they are reserved. They have an address from the address space. So this black region is reserved. The addresses are reserved for special function registers, such as the port direction registers, the priority register, the uh, IRQ control register that we will see uh, uh, next time. The following bytes, which are from address 400 to uh, uh, 400 to FFFF, basically, to this address are basically four kilobyte of double EEPROM. They are mapped to a four kilobyte of double uh, EEPROM. The next bytes, this section is basically a flash, 16 kilobyte of a flash. The next section who is 16K paged window, which is something maybe we talked a little bit about it. We said this microcontroller supports up to 256 kilobytes of memory, but we only have 16 bits for, for address, which implies this microcontroller can address only 16, uh, two to power 16 locations, which is 64 kilobytes. How, will, how can it address 256 kilobytes? Basic, basically through paging, but I will not talk about it. In other words, there are other bits that can be used to uh, access more uh, uh, locations. 
And finally, what I'm interested in is this, which is I talked about the last addresses, which are from FF, uh, FF00 to FFFF are, is, is the, are, the, uh, are the memory locations allocated for uh, interrupt vectors, for interrupt vectors. Okay, now, as I said, we are talking here about the specifics of the interrupt uh, uh, thing related to the HCS12. So this slide tells uh, us what happens on an interrupt when an interrupt request arrives to the HC in, uh, within the HCS12 uh, uh, system. Uh, so basically, uh, we have a few points. If the interrupt is maskable and enabled, or if it is non-maskable, non-maskable such as the SWI and the XIRQ, the, C the CPU completes the execution of the current instruction. So the request will not be serviced immediately. The CPU will finish the instruction under uh, processing. Then it will pay attention to the interrupt request unless, except unless the, the, the current instruction is a fuzzy logic instruction, which, some, which is something that we will not use in this uh, uh, course, because this microcontroller, by the way, supports fuzzy instructions, supports fuzzy instructions. So basically, the CPU finishes the current instruction. Next, the CPU saves the return address to stack. This is very important in order to be able to go back uh, once the ISR service execution is over. The CPU saves all the CPU registers, A, uh, B, X, Y, condition code register to the stack. And this figure shows the order by which these registers are saved. So if the stack pointer is initially initialized to point to this location, we will the CPU will push CCR, then A register, B register, X, Y, and then the return address, and then the return address. Then the address of the ISR is fetched from the corresponding interrupt vector address and loaded in the program counter. So we need to start executing the ISR. We need its address. So we fetch it from the interrupt vector table, uh, depending on its type. Each interrupt source has its own address. The ISR is executed and expected to be terminated with an RTI instruction which is a return from interrupt instruction, which is basically has to get to, to take it to, to take it to take us back to the main program with our status that was there before uh, serve, uh, uh, starting to service the interrupt request. In other words, the RTI instru instruction will pull or pop uh, the return address then it will pull Y, it will pull X, A, B, A, and the condition code register. It will load this the return address in the program counter in order to resume the execution from where we were interrupted. Uh, this is about the interrupt priority, which we already discussed. In order to change, uh, as we said, one of the maskable interrupts can be raised to the highest priority among the maskable interrupt group and receive a quicker service. So changing the priority is only limited to maskable interrupts. And basically, it is limited to the fact that you can make one of these maskable interrupts has the highest, while you cannot change the order, the relative order between the remaining or the other interrupt sources. This is achieved by programming the HPRIO register, which is a special function register with an address of this address. This is the address of this register. So basically, in order to, to change the priority of some interrupt, you write the value that, is on, that was on the rightmost column on that table to this uh, register. And this is very straightforward. You just store the value to this address. It is very straightforward. So to raise the maskable interrupt source to the highest priority, write the low byte of the vector address of this HPRIO register, which is the same as in the uh, table. This was shown in table 6.1, which we already saw. This is the 
the content of that register usually it is shown in the data sheet uh, like this so it is an 8-bit uh, register it, it contains set of bits where you can store where you can store the um, the low byte of the interrupt vector address in order to raise its priority. Now note that the least significant bit is always zero because if you go back to table 6.1, you will see that the low byte of the address, of the interrupt vector addresses is always an even address. If you remember, a reset vector address, it starts at FFFE, okay? And the following one starts at FFF, what C it will be C it will take C and D in next uh, address so this this byte or this bit is always zero because the low byte if I go back here if you look here at the low byte it is always even number so the, 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 the least significant bit is always zero so this value is F2 here it is the low byte of the address it is the low byte of the address. Okay, so this is the interrupted priority. So, uh, okay, we, it took us some time today. I, well, I expected to finish this part, but it's okay. So next time we will uh, go into more details about using the IRQ interrupt and the XIRU IRQ interrupt and the SWI interrupt. So you can help me, and then we will talk about uh, how to use interrupts in our programs, how to write programs that use uh, uh, interrupts. So please help me by going through these slides in order to go faster uh, in this uh, topic, okay? So we, we will discuss these things uh, uh, next time. Any question before we uh, end this class? Basil? Basil, you have a question? Hello, Basil. question uh, انتربت إذا كبسته يعيد ال البرنامج من أول هلا إذا بدي أكتب الروتين تبعه بدي يكون إنه مثلاً في برانش أو إشي بس ما بدي أرجع منه هل إشي هذا ممكن ولا لا وين بدك تروح لأول البرنامج من أول يعني بدي أعيد البرنامج من أول طيب خلاص سوي جنب لبداية البرنامج وبس بس هيك مش هيك بعمل ماسك السي سي ار بيت بنعمل له ريسيت او او عفوا بنعمل له سيت فما برجع ما بزبط ارد اكس كامر ما هو باي ديفولت باي ديفولت ويل سي ات نيكست تايم باي ديفولت اف يو جو تو ذا سي سي ار ريجستر ذا انتربتس ار باي ديفولت ديسابلد اند يو نيد تو انيبل ذيم بيفور يو كان يو كان يوز ذيم so if you uh, if you branch from the interrupt service routine back to your main program, basically you will have all interrupts disabled, which is very similar to the case when you have a reset, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you need you you will when you start executing the program from the beginning, there are, there is some instruction that enables the interrupt. Okay. You see the idea. So ah, you okay. have this is the start of your program. But this is not like uh, professional. Why? Why will? أنا كنت المثال كنت أفكر فيه مثلاً لو عندي two interrupts إذا كبست واحد ينفذ برنامج معين إذا كبست الثاني يروح على البرنامج الثاني. Yes, you can do that. You don't have to go back, but you need to keep in mind that the stack pointers, the stack region will not be. Uh -huh. might not be reinitialized. So you may have your main program that starts here. So you have a set of instructions to initialize, let's say the ports and the interrupts and the peripheral devices. So before you start receiving interrupts, 
from these sources, you need to enable interrupts. And this is usually done by clearing the interrupt bit in the CCR. So there is a special instruction, which is which we'll see next time, CLI, it clears the I bit, it clears the I bit in the CCR register. So this sets the I bit to zero in the CCR register, which means it enables all maskable interrupts. So now if you continue in your program, this is your main program, for example, this is done, uh, let's say branch to done, right? Something uh -huh. like that. And here you have, re you received an interrupt request. So you will change the flow of the program to the ISR. And in the ISR, you expect to execute at the end RTI in order to go back to the main program, right? So this is the program execution. But now what you want to do in your case, you want, let's say, say branch start, right? Okay. Uh -huh. So during program execution, when it is interrupted, you will not get here. You will, when you reach here, you will go back here. So you will start executing from here and the CLI will re-enable the interrupts. They were uh -huh. disabled. When you entered here, they will be disabled automatically. So if you do this, then you can clear, it will be, they will be cleared. But if you branch, let's say here, a branch to uh, L1, and this is L1, yes, the interrupts will, will, will stay disabled. They will not be re-enabled. Okay. Okay. تمام. تمام. شكرا. Okay. Okay. So, أنا ما مش عارف إن هو كيف بدها تمشي الأمور. I'm not sure how things will go. There is يعني في كلام عن تأجيل الفصل الدراسي أو تمديد الفصل الدراسي. ما بعرف كيف الأمور تمشي بس إحنا نكملين إن شاء الله بنفس الألية. We are continuing. doing these lectures online until we hear something official uh, from the Ministry of Higher Education. Uh, today, uh, the minister said that they may extend the second semester. So if they do that, and hopefully they do that, actually, um, it's not convenient to do the lectures this way, or at least it's not convenient to do all the lectures. Uh, like we need some face-to-face, we need to give you the boards to work on the projects uh, and we need to do a lot of stuff. So let's see how things go. Uh, maybe by the end of this week, uh, it will be clear how the next phase will be executed. Tamam? So if there are no questions, we'll continue on Wednesday, inshallah. Um, uh, and talk about the more details of, of interrupts. Okay, so see you on Wednesday, inshallah.